Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Oh, Todd, this is my crew. Hello. I'm Noah, and that's my crew, Todd. <laughs> I'll draw on the short straw. Um, we're going to entertain you about double-handed sailing this evening. We're going to start with our little adventure to Osaka, which is a short video we did a couple of years ago. Good idea. It's two and a half years ago now. Next one's about to start, really. Uh, no, the next one's in 2023. We did have great plans of taking the new boat on great adventures that have all been cancelled. But um, anyway, we'll get on with our little presentation. The origins of the name of the boat is actually from the beast and the rum, in case people want. Some people think we're a bit crazy. We are, but not as crazy as others. <laughs> so these are the Omica 60s. They start next month to race around the world solo. Dubbo would have had a photo up here, but we don't. <laughs> that photo on the left is a long time ago, and that little person there is me. And there's a good, very good reason for showing this to you. 
and that I grew up sailing surf cats and not dinghies. And the next slides, well, uh, there's a few little challenges that we get into about sailing with A-sails. My crew has a lot to answer for in getting me into this mess. Um, my brother and myself had a Sydney 40 for a couple of years called High Anxiety. And you'll see there's a bundle of people on that boat, too many to remember their names of, and it was too big to get out of the pen uh, without three or four people. So we had enough of that, and I said, well, I want a boat I can sail either by myself or with just one other person. And so came the Sunfasts. So this is the first one, the 3200. And when I was learning to sail with asymmetricals, for some reason, we ended up with these horrible little things, which made my life very difficult. Made him a good driver, though. <laughs> As a result of that, it took me about 18 months to learn how to drive asails. Um, but I suppose, yes, I am much better for it. Thank you, crew. <laughs> um, when the 3200 first came on the scene, I'd been over, um, a mate of mine that used to have a boat here, a FAR 47 um, or 97, uh, rang me up from England, he'd moved back there and he said, um, I've been looking up transsexual and I came across this race that says transquadra, you want to do it? <laughs> Holy crap, what are you on about? He goes, um, no, I came across this race, it's two-handed across the Atlantic. I went, sounds fun. Uh, he goes, I've bought a brand new boat, so you better come and do it. Um, it's supposedly an amateur race for over 40 year olds. Um, when we got there, we worked out the French version of amateur is a fair bit different to ours. Um, we had Capric Racing, um, Safria Racing, all the, all the guys, they just sacked them the day before. So they're unemployed, they're amateurs, off you go. Um, and it was a bit weird, you know, we didn't speak their language and they were, everything was in French. But um, we got back from that adventure and Todd said, so what was that little boat like? I went, that's the go. They're great fun. They're easily handled by two people. Um, and he goes, well, if I get one, let's do it, eh? I went, yep, done, sold. So that's how we ended up with that one. Moving right along. So in 2014, we had the 3600 delivered to Sydney. So this was Kraken number two. Those two shots, one on the left is us finishing Melbourne to Hobart, and the one on the right to Sydney to Hobart we did in 2014. The one on the left is the most horrid, hated patch of water that I have. And for anyone who doesn't recognise it, that's the Derwent. We've been there three times, and it's been like that all three times. <laughs> And the new Kraken is the 3300, which is in the pan on G jetty. And this is a very interesting boat. It's a very wet boat compared to the other two. <laughs> Even I wear a smock, so it's a wet boat. Uh, it's a lot faster off the breeze than either of the other two. We'll sit on 15 knots off the breeze in 20 knots of breeze. Um, and on the George Law, we were reaching along at uh, 10, 11 knots. It took Crusher a little while to catch us, where's Dave? <laughs> now a little on general uh, double-handed sailing and what we have and what we'd recommend for other people to have. A very big part of what I'm about with our racing is preparation. Big part of the outcome of our results, I feel, is before we even leave the pen on where what determines how successful we'll be in a race. And with that, if you have, if you want to do double-handed racing, um, fix everything and make sure everything works. Because uh, when there's only two of you, you don't want things. If one thing goes wrong, that might be okay. Often, one thing will lead to another thing. It will be dark, it will be windy. A pl 
place for everything and everything in its place. Sounds simple. Again, when things go wrong or you need something, you want to know where it is. A lot of this, um, so in terms of having stowage charts and the safety requirements around offshore sailing, it's for a very good reason, and particularly for people like us in doing what we do. So I'm fully supportive of those systems and all the documentation and audits that go around that. Once, when, when we set up systems, we do them piecemeal. We'll, uh, so when we did barley, for example, we fitted lithium batteries for one race, made sure they worked. We fitted a water maker, we made sure that worked. Uh, we did have to change the intakes to the water maker to make sure we could actually make water. So there was a lot of modification that we went through to ensure that the boat would do what we needed it to do. That uh, also, over the years, with my learned friend here, we have tested many manoeuvres, um, some much better than others, <laughs> but there's not too much we haven't done in terms of it crashing about the ocean. That includes losing rigs. You know, we've, we've lost a rig in pretty much heavy conditions off Denham and we managed to get rid of it and do it quite comfortably, quite peacefully and it's all about, we knew where everything was, what had to happen next, and we had a system in place to achieve it. And that's all it is, it's you must have a plan for everything, for every manoeuvre. There must be a recognised way that you do it. And a B and C and a D, and <laughs> occasionally an E plan as well. Yeah, Doug, I didn't mention he'd practiced this rig dropping business before. <laughs> it was his fourth strike. And we have had the odd road trip. And uh, if you can spot the differences in these two pictures, one has a mast and one doesn't. We've got a blockage on our tree. <laughs> there you go. That's over to my crew. Um, sails. So we've toyed with new, normal Hetzel systems. We've toyed with um, all sorts of different ways of doing things. Uh, we think we've refined it down to we only run two Hetzels now. We um, have a number one, a number two that reefs down to a number three. And if you're using membranes, you can actually load up the internals of the sail, the, it'll take the load. Um, that is our slowest manoeuvre, is heads or changes. Um, we've been beaten regularly by having to change head tools and watch other people just sail away. Um, other than that, we, we run the triple reef IRC main. Nowadays, you don't need a trisel. Um, as long as you reef and you talk to your sailmaker, Jeff will be all over it. Every, I think pretty much every sailmaker is all over it. As long as your third reef is in the right position and organised, you do not need a trisel anymore. They finally worked out that it's more dangerous plugging it in than it is putting the third reef in. Uh, we run three code zeros, a masthead code zero. Um, this boat has a choker which pulls one of the masthead um, halyards into the mast and creates a fractional halyard. So we run a fractional zero and what's called, I don't know, we call them a jib zero, a joe. Norths call them a bro. I don't know what UK call them, joe. Most people call them a jib zero. Norths in their wisdom call it something else. Uh, we run a staysail and a storm jib. Um, the staysail's more for off the breeze, uh, triple-headed reaching, um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's not a light spinnaker cloth one, it's more of a beam reach, triple-headed job. Uh, for, if you, we were talking about what we have that is different to what a normal boat has, and, and there actually isn't a lot. Um, we're thinking if we had a bigger boat, oh, that's great. Another one. Um, 
we found asymmetrics are a lot easier to handle. You just haven't got that pole. Um, get rid of that pole and your life gets a lot easier. Uh, but mind you, you go to France and most of the double-handed guys run spinning poles. How they do it, we don't know and we don't really care. <laughs> uh, if you had a larger boat, um, we, we don't recommend foils for your headsails. We run hanks. Um, that way, if we do get in the ship, we just let the halyard go. We know the headsail's going to land on the deck. Uh, it's not going to go anywhere. It's there. We can go and sort it out or tidy it up later when time allows. Um, if you've got a larger boat, you probably have a furling headsail and you can just furl it away. Um, other than that, we don't really have much else. It's on our delivery to Melbourne. Yes. We run a lot of electronics on the boat to do what we do. Um, you don't have to do this, but for us to do the sailing that we do and be competitive against fully crewed boats and beat other double-handed boats, this is what we do. So it's a full BNG H5000 system. Um, so with and what, what's critical with all of this is boat speed, true wind angle, um, being able to set up all autopilots to sail either to course or to um, true wind angle or apparent wind angle. Uh, within this, so a lot of it's standard now in terms of ha having AIS and the likes. Uh, there's a few additional items, so we run electronic barometer. Taking photos of days. <laughs> <laughs> the the opposition <laughs> taking notes. <laughs> Water temperature is always important for around um, sea currents and the likes, particularly for long offshore passages, um, and yeah, very good indicators of when you're in and out of currents. Uh, battery monitoring and power. We have a separate slide on that, uh, which is also very important for when we're doing. Long, longer races. But what do you actually need? Well, a boat to start with, and uh, if you don't have one, I have a spare, so see me after. <laughs> <laughs> to do, uh, say, a Terry Fisher or to get into shorthanded sailing, you could actually do it quite cheaply and easily just with a simple auto pilot. Um, and that could just be a low spec bolt on ram um, and that could in, in essence just steer to a course which would allow, allows you to free up yourself to assist your crew when you need two people to do a job. Most of the time we actually hand steer, it, it really depends on the conditions but a lot of the time we would hand steer over using the autopilot uh, and that's because it's faster. Autopilots, as much as um, Sydney to Hobart won't you let us use one on course because they think it's an advantage, um, they're reactive, they're not proactive, and they're, they're never going to be proactive. They're always going to react to what's happened under the boat to, or the, to the wind. They don't see stuff coming. And you want to log, you have to know how fast you're going. And record it. <laughs> And you can actually get out there and have a go just with actually doing something as simple as that. Now for some reason, my crew here thought it was summer and I obviously thought it was really cold. He wasn't grinding. <laughs> it's not my job. <laughs> Communication, so part of our electronics uh, HF radio, the full gamut there, you can all read, but all you really need is a VHF radio nowadays, and particularly for out here. So if you want to do a Terry Fisher, grab a VHF radio, an autopilot, one other person, good to go. And a boat. <laughs> this is the nav station on the 3600. HF, stereo, VHF, 
battery monitor, switches, switches, chart plotter, iPad, confuser. Sat phone, barometer, fan. Man overboard and double handed, stay on the boat, don't fall off. Words of wisdom here from my crew is the top line keep your belly button below the top rail. Um, we run additional jack stays, so we run jack stays across the cabin top as well as jack stays along the deck. And the jack stays along the cabin top. Basically, if you're clipped on there with a short tether, you can't fall off the boat. The only other item which may be a little different is that we do have man overboard buttons. So on the 3600, we had them at both steering wheel, at both pedestals for the steering wheels. And on the new boat, we have one either side of the cockpit where you'd be sitting, where the skipper would sit with the tiller. So basically that means otherwise to set off a MOB uh, GPS location you would have to go downstairs and hit it on the plotter. We can just press a button and, and it will put a spot on the chart. Um, as a set up now they go off like accidentally, but we'll change that. Yeah. Now to run all of these electronics takes a few kilowatts. So if we so when we're doing Asaka, we were drawing 15 amps most of the time, sort of 12 to 15 amps. So which is a, a lot of power in a day. Um, for that, so we had 400 amp hours of lithiums uh, of um, house battery. But it still meant we'd need to charge four hours a day, which took five litres of diesel, which then required 175 litres of fuel. So we also have a hydro generator that will generate 300 watts of power. And as long as we, we ran that for a week and that meant we had enough diesel to not have the hydro generator in the water for the rest of the race. But it was uh, basically gave us a backup as well. So for the long races like that, you've got a big trade off between all your power draw for running the boat, so computers, comms, instruments, your water maker, and then how much fuel you're carrying and where you're going to put that fuel and the weight that goes with it all. And that was us just prior to leaving for Melbourne to do the Osaka. So that was our 80 litres of diesel on the deck, the hydro generator, um, sat dome for the satellite phone, radio aerials, uh, everything else that we had on the boat. Sleeping, it'd be nice to get more, we never do. Um, on a short race, and we call a short race now anything up to two or three days, which used to be our long races. Um, in essence, we'd sail fast, look after boat, look after ourselves last. Um, and we'd literally do that. So for something like Osaka, uh, we'd reverse that because we'd need to look after ourselves and the boat, and we'd sail fast last. That was our last priority. Uh, and we actually did that. So at night time, if we were too tired to be flying spinnakers and the likes, we just wouldn't do it. We've never really run a firm watch system. Um, it depends on the conditions. So often, if it is rough and we've got to shoot up, regardless of whether it's day or night time and you need a nap, have a nap in the cockpit floor, and I know we now actually have a beanbag bed for that purpose, so it's comfy. No one should tread on you, because he should be driving. <laughs> um, yeah, so when we did Bali, actually, we worked out, we averaged about four hours a day for the, actually, it's eight days to do Bali, but that was enough. But in essence, we sleep as much as we can whenever you can. You treat sleep a bit like a bank. The more you can put in, the less you have to draw out later. It's um, a bit of a bonus if you can get a couple of hours without anyone 
annoying you. And then, then when you wake up, you go up and you feel refreshed and they'll do the same. It's a pretty reciprocal sort of situation. The thing is, you both have to be able to do everything on the boat so that that can happen. And in preparing this uh, presentation, we actually went through and basically worked out that we don't actually have anything that that's special that other boats wouldn't have. So a few items that did come to mind is we run a Martin breaker to fire the tack when we're dropping the spinnaker, um, lazy jacks for the mainsail, the soft shackle for the cunning ham for when we're reefing. Um, and on the 3200, we did use, we did have a furler for the uh, spinnaker, but well, we don't use furlers or snuffers at all on the spinnakers. Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> We've actually, we sort of, over the time, worked out that it, it's actually quicker and easier to drop it like a conventional boat. You know, fire the tack, pull it in, so I'll go downstairs and be pulling it in as he's lowering the halyard. It's, um, it's probably not for everyone, but it works for us. That's probably got a lot to do with the size of the boat as well. You can go through these next few. Um, jiving with this kite up. Uh, so we figured a lot of people here would probably like to know how we do these things. Um, not that different to anyone else, really. We actually prefer to inside jibe uh, wherever possible, and our prodder is long enough that we can comfortably do it. Um, if we outside job, we regularly lose the sheet under the boat and that's a nightmare getting it back out. We do have um, dicks on the A-sails, but they don't always work. It only has to flog three or four times and it's gone. And I am known to do that. <laughs> yeah, we both are. Um, uh, with the inside job, another trick with having just hanks. Um, if it is windy and you are worried about the kite getting inside the forestay and becoming a bit of a mess, pull the headsail up. It doesn't have to do anything. All it has to do is fill in that triangle. Nothing else can fit in there. And with Hanks, it's simple. Yeah, well, I can do it from the cockpit. It doesn't have to be set, doesn't have to be tight. Just got to be up and fill that gap. Um, we always cheat to the cabin top. Um, that way, for a jibe, I can control of both winches comfortably. So the new one will be preloaded with a handle in it and the old one will be eased out and once I've eased it to my mark on the sheet, which another pretty important thing is that marking things. We haven't really done that on the 33 yet. But um, I had a nice wear mark on the 36 that I knew. Just going to say, we didn't mark them on the 3600. Yeah, but there was a nice just... wear mark on the guide sheet. I knew where it had to be. Um, send a main. Um, it's a lot easier to jibe a kite if the main is in, locked in the middle of the boat and you can ease it out, ease it out, flick the boat over, pull it through. It's, it's actually quite simple in theory. Um, it takes a fair bit of practice to get it down, but it's actually good in theory. Uh, we usually put Todd to leeward before the jibe, so as soon as the boat's jibed, he's on the high side and is instantly in control of the boat. <laughs> That's if he doesn't fall over on the finish line when we're about to do it. Uh, other than that, we, it, it's the same. Um, we go through a jibe with the A sails up. You try and come out of the jibe at the same true wind angle as you went into one. So if you're running at 150, try and come out at 150. It, it just keeps the boat level, controlled, and easy to handle. Uh, our hoists, uh, no different to anyone else. Um, I, most boats nowadays that run A-sails run a Martin breaker. And all it is is an automatic fire the tack system. Um, can be set up quite simply with a couple of little clips and a 3 mil dynamo. Or 2 mil dynamo, I think ours is. Um, so, yep, yeah, it's the same. Uh, before a kite hoist, everything's clipped on, the bag's clipped onto the foredeck. Most important one, because they're bloody expensive if they go over the side. Um, clip on and everything set up and ready to go and you double check everything. The barber hall is off, the lured sheet's free to run, the windward sheet's free to run, everything, the winches are loaded, the halyards loaded, the jammers are shut. It, it, um, it actually confuses us when we get 
an extra person on the boat because we've got our system and we know what has to happen and when and how. And when someone else is on the boat trying, supposedly helping, um, well, they usually are. It's just they do something out of order or out of sequence and it just sort of throws everything off. Um, yep, there's no, nothing other than what every other boat would do. Yeah, well, that's theory. <laughs> Faster than you. <laughs> yeah, that's all that matters. Uh, with our Martin breaker, I forgot to say, um, before I pull the tack out to the end of the prodder, it is clipped onto the tack clip on the um, tack line. It's all set, but it also has a firing mechanism back in the boat, back um, on the pulpit, that we don't set up until the kite is up, running away and comfortable. Then I'll go forward, put that little clip onto the loop, and it's already, it's armed. Um, so as soon as we ease the tack line, it fires, the tack releases, and we can pull it in quite comfortably. Uh, the other one is dropping it with halyard, kite halyard and the actual letting it go. Um, a good trick, and it works on any boat, and I don't know why more people don't do it. Um, one wrap around the winch, throw the halyard out the back of the boat, in the water. It can't pigtail, it can't knot, it can't do anything, it actually straightens it out again. Um, heavy days, two wraps around the winch, throw it out. And as the friction on the halyard reduces, as the halyard gets closer to the boat, it gets easier to pull in, but there's less kite up there, so it, it actually works quite well, and more people should do it. This is, um, we, last, last year, last Sydney to Hobart, we sailed on Mr Lucky and Deb and Rob came out from the UK and this is Rob's boat, Bellino, in the UK. They run a symmetrical and um, the pole, etc. on uh, a Sunfast 3600 uh, and this is them going through a jibe. So, um, and Deb actually stepped off a 32, her own 3200, and she would run that solo uh, and jive that by herself with a pole in up to 20 knots of breeze. So it can be done. Um, here, what they do though is they jive the pole first and then jive the boat. And that's sort of showing here. Okay, we've got our boat, we know how to go fast, all we've got to do now is work out where to go. Um, so, predict wind, so the software and what we do, uh, we run predict, predict wind. Titec, we used to use several years ago when we needed it. I don't know if I'd use it again now. Then there's other, there's information everywhere on the web in terms of getting wind files, current files and the likes and there's various sources of them and I'll present a couple of them this evening. Then we plug it all into Expedition and out comes a route of where it thinks we should go. One of the things when you're at sea for four or five weeks you get very attuned to the data, what it means, how good the data in has to be to give you the data out and where you need to be. And if you're not where the course says you should be at the time it says you should be, it is all wrong and you start again. Um, and that's very important because the wind will change um, in hours. You know, we've had a patch when we're off Sydney, we would have been 200 mile off the coast. There was a forecast of a 20 degree wind shift uh, for about an hour, so just a small patch of the ocean and using the nine kilometer European wind model, it was actually there. So, and I was very surprised that it was that accurate. Um, that accuracy changes a lot depending on where you are in the world. The um, Northern Pacific, the, it was very inaccurate, the forecast. 
at the east coast of Australia, I was amazed at how accurate it was. Uh, yellow big trackers or blue water tracks. And then for the really long races, it's not just the 24 hours that you're worried about. You're also looking ahead for where do you want to be in three days' time, in a week's time, in two weeks' time, particularly if you're looking to cross the equator. Yeah. I learnt about this on the Bali race, about half an hour before I needed to know it, when I was about at sea. Um, Jess Sweeney had said, I'll oh, use these, you'll be able to pick up where, if, where the wind is off the Norwest Cape. And I said, that's really good. And she'd sent me the link. And what I realised is that, okay, you get this, this is off one page, but you've actually got to click into the square to download the actual grip file. So you click into the square you want. So these are up scanning, down scanning images from a satellite. <coughs> and then what you get is this sort of image. And for somewhere like the Norwest Cape, it will actually tell you if there's a big low off the Cape or not. So we use this for the Bali race. Um, and like I said, I'd work this out just in the nick of time. That was our race track for Melbourne to Osaka. Well, where are we meant to go? <laughs> no, actually we didn't show the detail. This was, so when, it's my little red light. When you sail up the East Coast and are looking to get up to Japan, as everyone does every day of the week, <laughs> There's various ways of getting through the Solomon Islands here, but one of the issues with it, you've got to decide about down here where you're going to go. And you don't actually have the weather to know that. So, because what's important is what's the weather out the other side of here, not what you're sailing in down here at the moment. You might have very good pressure down here, and then it's so you make your decisions and take your chances on the best information that you've got at the time. I thought this was pretty cool. <laughs> That's a figure 03. Um, so these guys uh, do the French circuit solo. This is also a figure 03, but don't do this. Racing and double-handed, it's simple. Just beat everyone else. This is us doing a very gentle cruise up to Bali. That was a fantastic race, the last Bali race. It was six days before we had a splash on deck. So we were loath to do it again because I don't think it'll ever be that good. <laughs> So a bit of a plug for Terry Fisher. So what are you waiting for? If you don't have a boat, see me. There's no excuse. <laughs> um, actually, just while I am here, autopilots and IRC. Everyone should know that with IRC, anyone can use an autopilot, whether you're fully crewed or double-handed. And that's within the IRC rules. Um, CYCA, you choose to ignore that, is all I'll say. And one of the things we always focus on is keep speed in the boat, always. It doesn't matter if you're sailing in the wrong direction, at least you're sailing. On our worst day in the Solomon Sea, we did 34 mile through the water in 24 hours. It sucked. <laughs> and hot, hot, hot. That, that was 34 miles through the water, not course. Yeah, and um, yeah, I think it was only about five mile in the right direction. Um, the other thing with, people often ask us, you know, what do you two talk about? Generally, we talk about making the boat go faster. How can we get point one, point two out of it? What if we did this 
yeah, no, no, let's not do that. That doesn't sound cool. Uh, what if we do this then? Um, it's always, we don't sit there and ch social chat. I, I don't think that's ever happened. It's always about making the boat go faster. What can we do to get that little bit more? That Always that little bit more. And I think most of the offshore boats be the same. I mean, the four deckies and guys on the rail talk, but we don't have that issue. <laughs> it's all true. Here's a quiz. If uh, I'll buy someone a rum, only because I like it. Does, uh, th this is a recent shot. Does anyone know who those people are? Well done. So that's Steve Caffari, Caffrey, and that's on a uh, Sunpass 3300. So they've, we're representing the UK and heading over to France to do some racing off France. Yes. No. D. 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 A B C D. And this was a very special day when we finished Asaka. <laughs> and and yes, um, what three hundred meters after this photo was taken, we did park in the mud. <laughs> um, yeah, I think when this photo was taken, we were celebrating, and I think the uh, Japanese were saying, turn left, turn left, really, now. Um, and we ignored them and didn't really understand what they were on about. Uh, we parked it in the mud, we called it valet parking. Um, and we that for a reason, because we actually had swap over crew came out and looked after the boat and took it in at high tide. <laughs> yeah, we went to the bar and the, a couple of guys that were managing the race sat on the boat for six hours and brought it back in. Um, when they did bring it back in, the barman goes to me, uh, you're going to go down and see your boat come in? I went, no, have you here? <laughs> Spent enough time on that. <laughs> and that's us, ladies and gentlemen. So, we'll take any questions. It's amazing what you can teach your body to do, and especially uh, with the Osaka. We sort of counted the Osaka down. It's 5,500 nautical mile directly there. We counted it down in Geraldton's. So five Geraldton's to go, four Geraldton's to go, three Geraldton's to go. Um, and it, it, it's a bit of a moral lift. Um, you know, you've done plenty of Geraldton's. You can do that doddle. You know, we've only got two to go. We're there. So. Through Osaka Port was, um, well, not Osaka Port, but coming in, what was the strait called? It was chaos. The, the ships moving at 35 um, knots, and they're just motoring through this strait. And they had to because of the current and the tide. But you're trying to get in, sneak in between them to get the other direction. It was um, possibly the hardest part of the whole race, was the last. 36 hours, um, but you know, you, you're, that, you're that close, so you just keep going, you, you'll get there. The last week was torture. <laughs> the last day was great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't know me, but Dumbo does, he expect this kind of question. I'm more interested in the social than I am in the technical. <laughs> which you explained really well. And I'm not interested in what you talk about, because you've already mentioned that. But what makes it possible for two people, what kind of characteristics do you need to do to have between the two of you, as well as the complementary, that allows you to do a race like that? Well, two-handed, but particularly on cycle. 
Um, I think we're pretty different in our own. You know, Todd's very um, technical, make sure everything's right, done, perfect. Um, I'm sort of more of a wing it. Uh, he can sail, I can't. <laughs> um, I, I think the differences actually help. Yeah, we bring different different uh, things to the table um, and we're both willing to listen and understand and work through anything and you, you, you've got to listen to each other. Um, we're good mates. I mean, we've been doing this for nine years. Um, we don't really need to say anything. He just says, you're ready to take Yep, let's go. Um, there's no worrying about people getting off the rail or anything. We, we just, I think we bring different... Yeah, just different things to the table and it, it, it keeps us far enough apart but close enough together that we don't have issues. We clocked up 25,000 mile on this uh, 3600. Four years. Three years. Uh, five. Sorry, so, <clears throat> sorry, so you, your watch systems you run an hour or it depends on weather, so you do an hour about or... Two hours or We've never really run a, a true watch system where you're up from 8 till 10 and then you're 10 till 12 sort of thing. We don't do that. Uh, conditions really dominate what we do and how we do it. Um, if it's rough as guts, we're both up. Um, if it's uphill and it's reasonably comfortable, no reason someone can't go down and get some good sleep. Um, generally on a Gerald, on the way to Gerald, we sleep in the cockpit. We usually got a kite up. Um, you sort of, it's a bit awkward. You're, you're laying in your beanbag bed, you're not asleep, but you're resting. And, and, and that's the important thing is you don't actually need that much sleep. You just need to rest every now and then, let your eyes get control again. But you, you've got two wraps around the winch and you're laying on the cockpit floor with a kite sheet in your hand. Um, it's in the self tailor, but you have to be pretty much ready to go off. Um, and Only if the driver screws up. <laughs> yeah, that happens. It didn't happen to both. Um, uh, yeah, we've ne never really done a true watch system as such. Um, I think m controlling crew uh, fatigue is one of the most important things that we do. Uh, and we, I think we do it quite well. You know, if, if the opportunity arises, one of us will go and get four hours sleep. And then they can look after the boat for four hours while the other one gets four. But if it's only half an hour, half an hour is half an hour. Take it, use it. Um, you know, we sleep, to, like I said it before, put it in the bank. You, you don't know when you're going to get your next one. 20 minutes and we're good for another six hours, eight hours. Yes. Mm. Oh, bloody hell. Yep. <laughs> Autopilot under IRC yes. right, seems to be very controversial. Right? So for the audience here, right, okay. doing an offshore race, okay, um, can you or can you not? You can. Um, basically, under IRC, international rules, and the local rule, we've spoken to Ian Ball, who's the IRC measurer, any boat racing IRC is allowed to use an auto helm. The problem we have here is we also run a race under PH, whatever it is, donkey. Um, and performance. Performance handy, oh sorry. <laughs> it's not dartboard at all, is it? Um, you're not allowed to use it in that. Uh, so you yeah, can... Yes, yes, yeah, we rewrote the rules so you oh, can. Sweet, you, yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> but for, to make it consistent, because you can under IRC, it then make it sensible obviously to do it under performance so, um, so the yellow book rules match the IRC working. so yes to reiterate to the audience anyone can use an autopilot racing no, no penalty it's part of the IRC rule so IRC rule I don't remember the number but it overrides the blue book rules yeah. And um, uh, they bought this in a few years ago. I, I remember it was still the breeze doing the barley that we before us, and um, they broke their steering cables and they were on the radio. And I just happened to be in the radio room at the time, and they were saying, "Well, we'll have to retire." I said, "No, you don't. 
turn your auto helm on. And they said, we can't do that, we can't do that. And I said, well, you bloody can. And um, they said, well, we're not going to do it until we've had confirmation from Ian Ball. So I got on the phone and rang Ian Ball and he radioed him and said, yep, go for it. Um, I, under IRC, I mean, IRC allows people to run gen sets to camp their keel and put winches and shit on. So you know, an auto helm is nowhere near as advantageous as that. Maneuvers. Every sail manoeuvre that requires two people will use it. But in terms of doing miles of sailing, it really needs to be those medium conditions, say 10 to 16 knots. It's a lot easier to light a cigarette too if you can hit the button and turn around. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it really depends. We'll, we'll do some races and you'll steer all of it apart from when you're doing sail manoeuvres. If it's really light, uh, you can't use it, and if it's really heavy, you can't use it. And having the gyros, you guys, you guys run gyros? Well, j just one, one yeah. One. So there's just one. Um, um, so it's not like the Omica 60s run. It's not the, It's the same hardware system, but not their compasses. Not, not, they'll have the three you know, stabilised gyro compasses. It's much, much better, the gyro? Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. 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 So the, with an Omica 60, they'll actually surf the boat. Like, they'll pick up where the boat is on a wave and where it is in sort of three dimensions and take care of it. Yes? Do you operate on the first AIS? <coughs> yes, they're common now. Um, they're, oh, the size of a pen, about that big, that round. In, in essence, you get a VHF signal to your chart plotter from them. Um, so it's a, for most boats, because you'll be picked up by another boat, is the quickest way to get rescued. Um, it's the best device to have. So we still carry PLBs, so which are 406 megahertz so GPS transmitters. Uh, which you require to under your racing rules, but the AIS sticks is really the uh, better device. So it transmits from yourself to on board your yacht and then through VHF? No, so it transmits via VHF to your boat okay. well, and other boats that are in the region. Does yeah. AIS raise an alarm now, or do you still need DSC transmitter to raise an alarm? Because AIS only used to track. Yeah, you need DSC, I think, still. Raise alarm to where? So your AIS will only show you on the chart plot at the moment. Correct. But won't wake anyone up on the boat. There won't be a, an alarm showing that there is a man overboard. Yeah, yeah, no, we've got an alarm. Is that no. for the AIS? AIS, yeah, that's good. Yeah, it sets off an alarm. Yeah, the chart plot goes nuts. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's not with DSC. Yeah, so you're right. It's just a chart plotter alarm. If you get an AIS signal to your chart plotter, it alarms. Most important question of the night: Has a drink? I better have another run. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So, uh, what you're suggesting about your use of the uh, auto helm, is that fairly standard, say, in Europe or in, uh, in the case of uh, other boats? Is that just your choice? My understanding in Europe, they sail under much lighter conditions. So generally they get to use the autopilot a lot more. Um, and typically their double handed, handled, handed sailing they do it more on a solo basis, where they will take actually, say, a four hour on, four hour off stint and solo sail the boat. So they're the sail trimming and not driving at all. But it's really, I feel, because it's in much lighter airs that they get to do that. But one of the things that surprised me with Deb and Rob when they came out, so we had a windy Saturday night on the Hobart, so it was 25 to 35 knots. They couldn't drive the boat. 
in fact, there's only Dubbo and I that could drive the boat that night. So, and, I, and it was really because they hadn't sailed in those conditions. So they were competent sailors, they just didn't have the experience in those conditions. <laughs> no, we would have done well. Yes. Would you do would you do another Osaka race? I don't know. <laughs> it would need to be an air conditioned boat. It is so hot. It is indescribably hot. Um, from Gabo Island, so we had, Zeke gave us all this fancy wet weather gear for all the 3600 crews. Um, fantastic gear, we wore it for two days, one day at the start and one day at the end. From Gabo Island we had 27 degree water temperature to a day and a half out of Japan where we had 24 degree water temperature. Solomon Sea was 32 degrees. Hot is an understatement. It's sort of 42, 43 degrees on deck and same downstairs, but humid as well and a little smelly as well. Um, but it was better than being in the sun. It, there was just no, there was no reprieve. It was, it was just rancid hot. So, so was so, it hot now? <laughs> it was rancid. <laughs> Not selling it very well. <laughs> um, hey, look, it, you, you seem to forget uh, the worst parts of races and always remember the best parts. And honestly, the arrival in Japan and the way we were treated, it, it, you, you've never done anything like that. It was unbelievable. The party was definitely worth it. Uh, the, uh, which one? There was a party for every single boat. And I mean, a big party for every boat that finished. No matter what time of day, no matter when, how, there was, it was huge. It was unbelievable. And we did some amazing things in Japan. We went into a shrine, that, an ancient shrine that, you know, people, no, we were, what, 12th, 13th white people to ever be in there. Yeah, the, the trophy presentations done in the Japanese shrine that most Japanese can't get into. So you, you do get to do some very special things. And I don't know, crossing, it's the first time I've done a large ocean crossing like that, and where you get to smell dirt. So when you get back close to land and you smell dirt. And, and that's quite a remarkable experience. <laughs> Grumpy <laughs> bugger off. <laughs> yes. So, um, you use your um, safety or your, um, your, your giving gear the first day and your last day. So, in the middle of all these, when you did have 35 days left, what did you use for safety gear on board for yourselves? Um, you spend most of the day in your jocks, um, chasing thunderstorms hoping it'll rain long enough to soap up and rinse off. So we've had that, we had a, a thunderstorm coming, you lather up, by the time you go to rinse off, it's all gone, you stand in there covering soap. But, um, it looks pretty though. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, safety gear, we, you, at night, um, I mean, it's, it's light. I could have swam 10 times faster than what the boat was doing most of the time. I'm not that good a swimmer. Um, it, it, you, you just tried to stay out of the heat. You couldn't wear your life jacket for too long. You, you'd sweat underneath it ridiculously. Probably enough to set it off. Um, yeah. oh, the, the, the main thing, so often you're in shorts basically. So um, you just throw an AIS stick in your shorts. That, that's the most important piece of kit. If you fell overboard, you have that. You're pretty much out of EPIRB range anyway. I mean, yeah, they'll get the message, but they're not going to send a helicopter out there. Yeah, so you accept you die. Well, no. No, you don't ever accept you're going to die. You make sure the guy you're with is competent enough to come back and get you. Um, and that's, I, I mean, that is the trick. You need to have absolute, complete faith in each other that no matter what happens, um, and I, I 
didn't do this with Todd, but I did it with Chris on the first um, uh, transatlantic. He goes, no matter what happens, I will bring home a body. Um, if that's the worst case scenario, I will bring them home something to bury. Um, and, and that sort of hit a nerve then and there. And um, it's always been, you, you just do not do it. Just stay on the bloody boat. Yeah, t touch wood, in nine years of sailing, we've never gone close to getting in the drink. And we've done nearly everything you can do with these boats. Belly button lower than the lifeline. It's easy. Yes, they were very inaccurate. Um, by then, we we're only getting GFS files. Like, left. Either PWE or G GFS. I can't remember. Really they just weren't accurate. Once you're into the Northern Hemisphere, um, there's no one there, so they don't care. Um, a lot of these files are based around population density. So, uh, off the east coast of Australia was sensational. You get up into Papua New Guinea and they're not doing that much ocean raising and, yeah, and the locals go, yeah, it's going to rain. That's all they get about. Um, so, yeah, you didn't get the accuracy that you'd get down here. Mind you, we also, WA is nowhere near as accurate as East Coast either. We, we just haven't got the population to warrant it. Any which way? Uh, well, we have um, so the normal gear, so ho ho horseshoe, life ring, um, inflatable Dan Boy, and a rescue sling. Um, all the boats have a very low transom to the water, uh, and the and a ladder, yeah, a ladder, and also all the rear lifelines clip off. Yes, really. I don't go over. Simple. Uh, his belly button's much lower than the line. <laughs> we have practiced it. Um, we actually, last time we practiced it fully crude, it was a shit fight in Sydney. <laughs> Absolute shit fight. We ended up drifting away and losing the boy and... Um, yeah, we do practice it, and we do have a procedure in place that we run with. Um, it, you just get rid of the sails, and if you have to motor up to them, you have to motor up to them. At the end of the day, the race is not important anymore. Yeah, we haven't... Uh, I went out on Platinum and we actually set up some systems for them to do exactly that, and put on retrieval lines with clips and the like so they could do that. We don't have those sort of systems in place. Really. We've got halyards and we've got winches. Yeah, because yeah, in essence I'd have to winch him back on board. No, he wouldn't. I won't go over. <laughs> Good answer. So we'll see you all at Terry Fisher. Yeah, and then, everyone there. And then x -Mail. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, Ty. And just as reassurance, the Terry Fisher legs are not that long. Sounds <laughs> encouraging, but a little bit intimidating. But if it, if it does inspire you, um, Terry Fisher is a good place to start. Friendly group of people, and like I said, a, a very large knowledge base to help you get involved.